Well hello, Andrew here again and today it's episode 47. We're continuing in uh, the little three-parter we're doing on the parable of the sower. Although the second part actually isn't about the parallel parable itself, it's about parables in general. So we pick the text up at Matthew chapter 13 verses 10 to 17. Then the disciples came and asked Jesus, Why do you speak to them in parables? He answered, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to those who have more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. The reason I speak to them in parables is that seeing they do not perceive, and hearing they do not listen, nor do they understand. With them indeed is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah that says, You will indeed listen, but never understand, and you will indeed look, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and their ears are hard of hearing. And they have shut their eyes, so that they might not look with their eyes, and listen with their ears, and understand with their heart in turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. As I said yesterday, we introduce the first parable that we find in Matthew, and we briefly considered it. I hope that... Um, you realise that when left to interpret it for ourselves, it's likely to have spoken differently to the way that Jesus explains it. You might have got a quite different interpretation from the one that we will pick up and consider tomorrow. This is not to say that Jesus' interpretation is wrong. It isn't. He is simply demonstrating something specific, which, as I said, we will consider tomorrow. The point is, however, that the parable interprets itself to each of us. I hope you notice that. Its meaning for us is actually hard to avoid. What it invites us into, where it makes us feel guilty, or angry, or sad, or joyful. Emotional responses to a parable are all clues as to how the parable might be speaking to us. Here's the thing. There's nothing particularly special about a parable. It's just a story. Though it's more than just a story. It has an archetypal quality about it. But I, by this I mean that there are elements in the story that speak to all of us. It's all our story. It has something to say. And we cannot avoid hearing it. As I said before, it interprets itself to us. As much as me, we might want to, we cannot avoid the interpretation. So why does Jesus use parables? In the passage we read, he tells us. And clearly, this isn't specifically about the parable of the sower. This explanation, which we just read, is an explanation by Jesus on the use of parables in general. I want to suggest that Jesus uses parables because the people don't get it. They don't see the kingdom of God. They don't see what God is up to. They don't understand. I used to think that this passage um, was Jesus passing judgment on the people. And that he was using parables instead of telling them what they needed to hear. That Jesus was being opaque or being crafty. He's being particularly hard to understand to ensure that the people didn't get it. I've since realised that the opposite is the case. Jesus actually is responding out of a profound compassion. The people he saw were incapable of receiving what he was offering. This was not a pronouncement of judgment against them by Jesus. It was simply a statement of fact. And just as a segue, that's something that crops up from time to time in Scripture. 
And we need to be careful because we can easily mistake a statement of how things are actually for a word of judgment. We can listen to it and think, oh, this is a word of judgment of God. And it may not be at all. It may be simply a statement of how things are. Jesus is not passing judgment here. I don't believe he is. Condemning the people to deafness. He's actually describing their selective deafness. And as a result of this, they could not, would not have heard if he'd spoken them to directly. He uses parables as a way of getting through the blockages. We have a very good example of this in the life of King David. In 2 Samuel 12, Nathan the prophet is sent to confront David about his adulterous relationship with Bathsheba and his murder of her husband. What does Nathan do? Well, he tells a simple story of an awful abuse of power. And David, when he hears the story, he flies into a rage, believing the story to be true, and demands the death of the perpetrator. Then the kicker. Nathan looks David straight in the eye and he says, You are the man. You are the perpetrator. And he unfolds the story, the wider context for him. The parable does the trick. It interprets itself to David, and he basically has nowhere to go. It's got him. The thing is that we all live in stories. Each of our lives is a story, a story that connects with the lives of others. As we hear the stories of others, we see our own story either mirrored or contrasted. The stories of others connect with our stories. And we can relate to what is happening for others. We all live in a meta-narrative, the big story, the common human story. And my bet is that a week from now, if I give you the title of this message and ask you what it was about, the thing that you're more, most likely to remember are the little story bits. Because we tap into those. You might remember the story of David. You might remember the story that I'm about to tell in a moment. It's those little story bits of the bits that really connect with us. And that's what wake us up and what draw us and what ignite us and what hold our attention. And they interpret themselves to us. So Jesus tells stories. He tells parables to the people. Not because he's trying to keep the whole kingdom thing secret. And actually, that's what I used to think. Probably it wasn't that long ago that I was sure that this was what Jesus was doing. But he tells them because he really does want them to get it. And this might be the only way. Stories, as I've said, have a way of by bypassing the logical filters that we construct. Barriers that we put in place to protect ourselves from hearing truths we don't want to hear. A direct propositional assault to David. You're an adulterer. You're a liar. You're a murderer, wouldn't be received. It'll simply be pushed aside or justified. Good news works the same way. You are profoundly loved by God. will immediately be met with an internal dialogue as to why that couldn't possibly be the case. I'm not good enough. I'm not holy enough. I'm not honest enough. I have too much sin in my life. There's no reason why God would want to love me even a little. I'm only worthy of the scrap heap. Then we hear the story of the prodigal son. And it does something within us at an emotional level. We become aware that it's not about worthiness at all. It's simply about a parent's unconditional love for their children. And at some place that draws us in and helps us to recognise that Actually, this could be true of us also. So Jesus uses parables to get past the blocks that we put up, to hearing both the good and the bad news when it's needed about ourselves. We can't help identifying with the characters in the story. It happens automatically and we can't stop it. And it may be different for all of us. We may find ourselves each 
at a different place, identifying with different characters. Because this story is the bit that connects with our story, which might be quite different from the person sitting next to us. I remember hearing that Gustavo Guterres, one of the main drivers behind liberation theology in Latin America, tells of leading a Bible study with the poorest of the poor. They are looking at the parable of the Good Samaritan. While in this parable, in the first world, we will almost certainly identify with the priest or the Levite, and maybe some particularly holy office might even identify with the Good Samaritan. The people that Guterres was working with identified the man who'd been beaten up and was left lying, bleeding and dying at the side of the road. Most of us would not have seen that coming. See, the story has different ways of connecting with our story, uniquely with where we are. Parables, as I said, interpret themselves to us, where we are right now. And it's worth noticing what they're saying to us. Tomorrow, we actually return to the parable of the sower. I hope this has been helpful. God bless you.